Good evening. Tonight we will hear testimony regarding the superintendent's recommendation to relocate Burtonsville Elementary School to the Northeast Consortium Elementary School number 17 site and the superintendent's recommendation for the boundary study scope for the reopening of Charles W. Woodward High School. We will hear both in person as well as video and audio testimonies and we are broadcasting this hearing live. The board will conduct a work session on Tuesday, March 14, 2023 at 10 a.m. If board members offer alternatives during that work session, the board will hold another hearing on March 20th. The board is scheduled to take final action on these matters at its meeting on Tuesday, March 28, 2023, which begins at 3.30 p.m. As always, board members are looking forward to hearing and considering your testimony. The order of speakers is printed on the agenda that is available on the board's website. Any written testimonies presented for tonight's hearing can be found on board docs. We will begin by having our board members introduce themselves. I'll start over on my left with Mrs. Yang. Good evening, Julie Yang. Good evening, Julie Yang. Thank you for being here tonight. Good evening, everyone. Lynn Harris, nice to see you all. Great to see everyone. Shebra Evans. Good evening, buenas noches. Good day, Rivera Oven, District 1. Good evening, everyone. Arvin Kim, student member. I am enthused about tonight. We also have our superintendent. I'll have her introduce herself and her staff. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Good to see you. And I am joined here with our COO and Deputy Superintendent and, and staff over uh, on the tables representing all of the offices. Mr. Hall. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Pat, Pat Murphy, Deputy Superintendent. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dana Edwards, Chief of District, District Operations. Hey, everyone. Seth Adams, Director of Facilities Management. Adrian Karamijas, Director of Capital Planning and Real Estate. Good evening, everyone. Keisha Addison, Director in the Office of Shared Accountability, here to represent the Office of Strategic Initiatives. Good evening, everyone. Rochelle Rubin, Chief of School Support and Wellbeing. Good evening, everyone. Brian Stockton, Chief of Staff. Buenas noches. Um, Elba Garcia, Senior Community Advisor. Good evening, Eric Garcia, Assistant to the Chief of Staff. Good evening, Libby Rogovoy. I'm the Executive Director for the Deputy Superintendent. Good evening, Peggy Pugh, Chief Academic Officer. And we have um, our fellow board members, uh, Brenda Wolf and Rebecca Smodrowski, watching from home due to illness. Um, and remind everyone to speak close to your mics, please, because as you can see here, the air is blowing. Uh, loudly and it's hard to hear if you don't speak close to the mic. So let's begin with our speakers who are here with us in person. When your name is called, please approach the podium and push the flat button below the microphone to turn it on and begin speaking. Please speak clearly and directly into the microphone. Please stay within your time frame because I don't want to have to cut you off. Our first speaker of the night is Samantha Ross. Please uh, come forward. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is Sam Ross, and I'm a sophomore at Montgomery Blair High School, one of the schools in the proposed scope of this boundary analysis. I am here in support of the proposed scope. However, I have a couple contentions with the rollout of co the communication regarding the current proposal and concerns regarding the future of the study. I have the unique perspective when it comes to this as a student who has visited and knows people at every high school in the scope, as well as being present at the meeting where this scope was presented, and having some of my questions personally answered by board members. However, many of my peers and community members, some of which may be here, don't have easily accessible information on questions such as why Churchill, Wooten, Rockville, and RM clusters are not included in the scope, as they are geographically close to Woodward and suffering from overcrowding. In short, I would ask that MCPS provide 
answers and explanations to questions that may arise as the scope is advertised and as the study continues, such as if Woodward will be in the DCC, if Woodward will offer a program competitive to certain overcrowded DCC schools, such as my own, and how the study will work to ensure equity. I am happy to see that Walter Johnson will have some of its urgent overcrowding I have seen myself be remedied. However, I am also worried that this boundary change could enhance current segregation we see in MCPS and the greater Down County area. I am here today happy to see the DCC included in the scope and with the hope that this wide scope will make our boundaries more equitable and ensure diverse schools. However, I will of course say I am never opposed to increasing the scope to other geographically neighboring areas to help prepare for their boundary changes coming with Crown High School and to maybe along the way tweak some boundaries and create better solutions to overcrowding. Finally, I want to ask that with another boundary proposal on the table, MCPS does not fall in its equitable proposal to pressure from other community members, as MCPS has in the past, particularly after MCPS had Sherwood and BCC clusters not included in the NEC and DCC respectively, due in part to parent complaints. But you can look across the room and see all the students here today supporting this scope. Montgomery County and MCPS schools are some of the most diverse in the state and the nation, but the legacy of racism and segregation hangs over our boundaries today. With this scope, we can hope to see a future of equity, and for that reason, I ask that you approve this study and keep community members' questions in mind as the study develops. Thank you for your time. Have a good night. Up next, we're going to hear from Joseph Sarihon. One more time. Good evening, Board of Education members and Dr. McKnight. My name is Yosef Zedihun. I'm a junior at Springbrook High School and a finalist for the student member of the Board of Education. Montgomery County has made immense strides towards achieving an equitable and just school system. Our county is full of diverse students, parents, and educators, yet we still face underlying issues of segregation with our consortiums and boundary lines. We must take the necessary steps towards making these changes rather than, rather than neglecting it to advance for the better. According to a 2019 report from the Montgomery County Council of Office of Legislative Oversight, 75% of all elementary students who identify as black, Latinx, or English learners are enrolled in high poverty schools in Montgomery County, while their eight white and Asian counterparts attend affluent schools. This report also generated focus on schools schools that had high concentrations of students in poverty. The report has shown us that roughly 75% of Latinx and black students were enrolled at these focus schools. And in contrast, roughly 71% of Asian and white students were enrolled at the non-focus schools. Mm -hmm. We cannot possibly say that the systemic inequalities and de facto segregation do not exist within our county when three quarters of black students, black and brown students attend impoverished schools while three quarters of white and Asian students attend more affluent schools. Time and time again, statistics prove that integrated schools lead to higher test scores, increased graduation rates, and higher levels of college enrollment. More importantly, they prepare all students to live and work across racial lines without prejudice, regardless of their socioeconomic background. For years, Montgomery County has claimed its dedication towards diminishing the opportunity gap and redefining the idea that a student's zip code should not define their education. I stand before you today with assurance that achieving this is possible. Closing the gap is possible. Making these strides toward a more equitable Montgomery County is possible. Every monumental decision made throughout history came with hardships and triumphs. And each crucial advancement up on the grounds of equity has faced enormous pushback. As we face similar pushback today, we must look forward to the generations ahead. We must look forward to a school system where every single student has an equal opportunity to succeed. The start of this new tomorrow is the establishment of Charles E. Woodward High School. Thank you. Up next, we'll hear from Praneel Savarna, Alani Bui, and Braden Miller. The light's on so you can begin. Good afternoon, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is Pernil Savarna and I'm a sophomore at Clarksburg High School. My name is Ilani Bowie and I'm a, a sophomore at Richard Montgomery High School. And my name is Braden Miller and I'm a junior at Albert Einstein High School. 
We wanted to speak with you all today to emphasize the importance of diversity, not just regarding race, but also income as a factor in the upcoming boundary study. All of us have experienced the effects that high diversity has on education, as we currently attend some of the most diverse schools in Montgomery County. In the past year, I've been able to socialize with hundreds of people, learning about different experiences, cultures, and problems that each part of the county faces. Some of my friends live only miles apart from each other, yet their lifestyles are vastly different. However, RM fosters a highly welcoming community that connects these worlds and disproves detrimental and often untrue stereotypes. Other schools that lack this level of connection aren't reaping such benefits. Diversity, both racially and income-based, is increasingly relevant to how stereotypes affect our students' perceptions of others. We've seen an enormous rise in anti-Semitism and other hateful behaviors that would have been minimized had, had schools originally been designed to encourage interaction among different students. It's necessary that all students have the chance to experience the multiple perspectives that we were able to have. Beyond that, we need to address the opportunity gap that exists in our schools. There exist large disparities in household income and in predicted future salaries based on zip code in our county. Within one mile of Woodward High School, average future salaries of children vary from forty dollars to $80,000 a year at age 35, one of the greatest differences in our county. It's no surprise that under the current system, these two areas are zoned for different schools. This goes to show the fact that, that educational opportunities have on students even years down the line. It is imperative that Woodward High School is reflective of the diversity in the county and will give students from all backgrounds the education that they need to succeed. Thank you. Up next, we'll hear from Faith Na. Faith? Okay, let's move on to Daniel Sue. Good evening, Dr. McKnight and the members of the Board of Education. And thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak today. My name is Daniel Sa, and I'm a junior at Richard Montgomery High School. And tonight, I'm proudly here to represent Montgomery County Students for Change in support of the proposed scope of this boundary analysis. Montgomery County has always been in support of the, the, the diversity that is in our school system and the inclusivity that we have built upon. This boundary analysis would increase the diversity in schools like Walter Johnson and would champion the ideas of diversity that MCPS is so proud on. The boundary scope of opening of Woodward High School would also address overcrowding in many schools in the Down County Consortium and Walter Johnson that has plagued these schools for many years. I went to Little Bennett and I personally know how bad overcrowding can be. I remember that when I was in third grade, our school had to remove our playgrounds in order to install um, portables for students because we had too much students at our school. In many schools and MCPS, like in the DCC and Walter Johnson area, this is a reality that many students often face. Often schools need to limit the amount of student parking, playgrounds, and other community areas in order to accommodate, accommodate the overflow of students at schools. Overcrowding not only hinders the safety and the mental health of the students by making them feel uncomfortable and unsafe at their own schools, but also hinders the education of these students. Time and time again, studies have shown that larger class sizes leads to um, decreased academic performance because teachers are not able to give the focus that each student needs and deserves. The scope will not only allow for equitable education for students living in the DCC and Walter Johnson area, but also provide more opportunities that our students demand. For example, many of the money that is now used for portables can be used for mental health resources, better test um, prep materials, and other materials in schools that will allow for students to grow and thrive. With this proposed boundary analysis, this will kill two birds with one stone as overcrowding in the DCC and the Walter Johnson area will be alleviated and the funding that's used for portables can be used to help the students and encourage student education. The boundary scope for the DCC and Walter Johnson school zone will not only be a win for both students and teachers living in the DCC area and the Walter Johnson school zone, but it will also be a win for MCPS as a whole. This boundary scope analysis will be a monumental step forward towards celebrating the diversity and the equity that MCPS prides upon. I urge you all, as the Board of Education, to approve the proposed boundary scope 
for the James Woodward High School in order to ensure a better future for all MCPS students. Thank you. Up next, we'll hear from Isabella Andrade. Hello and good evening, Board of Education members. First, I want to thank you for your time today. My name is Isabella Andrade, and I'm a senior at Quince Orchard High School. As we now discuss the reopening of Charles W. Woodward High School, I believe that the reopening of this school will give students in overcrowded schools back the ability to focus on learning and form crucial teacher-student relationships. Relationships critical for a student's success. As a student of MCPS, I have experienced the importance of having low student-to-teacher ratios. This past school year, I was a student athlete taking five challenging AP classes as a junior. Expectedly, my heavy workload demanded precious time and one-on-one -on -one help from teachers to learn the material. For example, in my AP bio class, my class consisted of 14 students. Where this class size was small enough and it allowed my peers and I to create a learning community where we all knew each other on a personal level. We would talk about anything from the latest news to DNA replication especially. But most importantly, with this small class size, our beloved AP bio teacher, Mrs. Short, was able to create a teaching style where every single one of us was able to effectively learn. In addition, she was also to create relationships with every student, specifically the ones who needed a little push to break out of their shell. If we want all students to succeed, Smaller size classes in MCPS will ensure that all students are able to have the crucial teacher to student bonds. From my experience, low, to low teacher to student ratio classes help students like me to be better prepared to take classes in college after graduation. With my testimony today, I urge all board members to reconsider the reopening of Charles W. Woodward High School. Thank you for your time. Up next, we have a video from Sof Sophie Nguyen. Please play the video. Good evening, Dr. McKnight and members of the Board of Education. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Sophie Nguyen and I'm a 10th grade student at Rockville High School. I will be speaking about the superintendent's recommendation for the boundary study scope for the reopening of Charles W. Woodward High School. So personally, I went to the Flower Hill Elementary School where we had to stay in portable classrooms in fifth grade. And this often resulted in us walking outside in cold mornings and several safety accidents when our windows and walls were on the verge of breaking down. We were also figuratively and physically separated from the rest of the school. And this is a true situation for many schools in our county, especially for those in the Walter Johnson region or Down County Consortium. Schools face problems of overcrowding and often have to invest money into additional infrastructure like portables when we could use those funds to academically and emotionally support our students. When schools exceed their capacity, it makes it difficult for students to do a variety of things, and that's not just limited to waiting for long lines in the bathroom or being in crowded hallways, but it also has a huge impact on what happens inside the classrooms. In regards to class sizes, if our classrooms are overcrowded, there are not going to be enough resources for each individual student because teachers cannot listen to individual needs or develop a good relationship, and this can often lead to lower academic achievement. And this is just not an issue that we can continue to ignore. Members of the Board of Education, in order to have more diversity, more opportunities, and more equity, I urge you to support and look into the Boundary Study Scope so that we ensure that our students have a safe place to learn. Okay. Um Thank you. Now I'm going to pause for a moment to uh, turn to my colleagues to see if they have any questions or comments. And I will start with Ms. Yang. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for our students for coming to testify. And I, I love how you all pay attention to something so abstract and not immediately impact just your schools, but the whole MCPS student. And there were three of you that were doing a testimony together and you were so synchronized that uh, that was truly teamwork impressive. So I heard your support for diversity, equity, and small class sizes is duly noted. Thank you for your advocacy. Ms. Harris. Yes, um, I just want to echo Ms. Yang's comments. Um, and, uh, you know, I really appreciate our students coming forward, especially when 
you're paying it forward because none of you are going to benefit from any of this. But, you know, that's the work that these guys are doing. So I thank you for speaking. And, and I really appreciate it, too. You know, you're, you're, um, the, the breadth of your testimony. You're not just talking, you're talking about equity, you're talking about diversity, you're talking about the fiscal impacts that would have on our system if we have fewer portables. You're talking about the impacts of smaller class sizes on, on mental wellness and, and mastery of content. I mean, you're really talking about so many of the different things that, that we, we struggle with as a school system and that are really, really important to learning because this isn't, this isn't a 20th century school system, it's a 21st century school system. And um, I also very much appreciate the ongoing tradition of our students speaking about a deep interest in increasing the diversity in our schools. Um, and I think that goes back when we first started talking about a countywide boundary analysis in 2019, and the students were speaking very powerfully to the need for increased diversity, and the grown-ups in the room not so much all the time. So thank you. Mrs. Evans? Sure, my colleagues have really said all that I want to say. I will say this, I, for the ones that turned in their testimony early, Sam Ross and a couple others, I read them in advance, and so I was very much impressed, as always, not surprised, um, but just as my colleagues have stated, just you all are really taking a vested interest in your education, you're studying, you're paying attention, and I really do appreciate that. So that's all I wanted to say. Good to see you all. And thank you for the signs, too. They look lovely. <laughs> this is Rebecca Oven. Um, so, as someone who works in the community, um, feeding thousands of families, so who created the, the hub model, first I want to encourage all of you to look at the hub, at the nearest hub near your school, to volunteer, because you're speaking not just for yourselves, but you're speaking for for many of your um, of of those students who cannot be here tonight because they're probably working taking care of their siblings where the mom's working a second or third job. So you're speaking for them and I want you to know that. And I, I, um, I appreciate, you inspire me every time. You're so poised, you're so eloquent, you give me hope. Um, so I hope you also do this at the county council because there's also a lot of things going on with rental um, uh, caps and so on. Take that passion as well, we need you. We need your voices in this dialogue. Because you know, because you deal with a lot of those issues, you support a lot of your peers who are going through food insecurity, who are, you know, barely paying the rent. We have communities in this county. We have a trailer park in Germantown. They're feeling that pain. You're speaking for them. So I want to say gracias and thank you for being here tonight and keep up the good work. Mr. Kim. Sure, very briefly, um, you all know it and you certainly expressed it today, for too long in this county, uh, systemic barriers ha have really hindered our ability to serve students in an equitable way uh, and, and in an equal way. And, and, and your testimony certainly speaks uh, to, to the changes we need to see. And, and the reality is uh, that this is what that revolutionary transformation looks like. This is precisely the work that it's gonna take to undo years and years of systemic barriers hindering students from accessing the quality of education they deserve. Uh, so thank you all. It's, it's an honor to serve you all and to call you my peers and, and my friends. Okay. All right. Up next, we have uh, organizations represented here today. And we can start with our first one, Dan Reed. Please come forward. Just turn on the button, push the button underneath the microphone to begin. Okay, all right. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dan Reed and I serve as Regional Policy Director for Greater Greater Washington. We're a nonprofit that uh, seeks equity in uh, land use, transportation, housing, but also education. Uh, I'm also a resident of Silver Spring and an MCPS alum, graduating from Blake High School in 2005. Uh, our organization supports the superintendent's recommendation for the boundary study scope for the reopening of Charles Woodward High School. Uh, our organization focuses on creating equitable communities, which we define as a place where people have access to all the things that make life better one of which is well-resourced schools. We approach this from a housing and transportation lens, ensuring that people live in neighborhoods with well-resourced schools and have safe, reliable transportation to get there. 
The school system hasn't done a countywide boundary study in decades, during which time our student body has become significantly larger and significantly more diverse. The result is a school system that remains segregated by race and class, which means some schools can have significantly more resources than others. It's also a school system where students attend overcrowded schools to pipe the presence of under-enrolled schools nearby or travel miles from home to an assigned school when other schools might be closer. The burden of these challenges inevitably falls hardest on students from historically disadvantaged backgrounds. Addressing these problems requires a wide lens, and this boundary study will provide that. It will look at the boundaries for the eight high schools and 14 middle schools surrounding the new Woodward High School in North Bethesda, crossing a wide swath of the county and a range of diverse communities from Bethesda to Wheaton and Tacoma Park. The broad scope of this study gives us more tools at our disposal to ensure that all the schools in Lower Montgomery County reflect the diversity of this county, make the best use of available space, and allow as many students as possible to live close to their school. We acknowledge that any recommended boundary changes will be very contentious, as it is no surprise that parents value the schools their children attend and the school communities their families are a part of. That's why we ask the Board of Education craft, craft an inclusive outreach process for the study that goes to where the most impacted students and their families are. There are a variety of ways to do this, such as pop-ups at community events, canvassing door-to-door, -door, uh, and beyond. A thorough public engagement process will ensure that the board hears from a representative sample of community members and has the information they need to make recommendations. Thank you for your time and consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions you have, and we look forward to working with you on the study. Thank you. Up next, we'll hear from Deborah Kornbluth Berger. Good evening, Dr. McKnight, President Silvestri, Vice President Evans, and the members of the Board of Education. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding the scope of the boundary study for reopening Charles W. Woodward High School. I'm Deborah Kornbluth Berger, and I'm honored here to be representing the Lux Manor Citizens Association. I'm the LCA school chair. I've had three boys graduate from MCPS and graduate from University of Maryland and obtain further education. And I now have a freshman at Walter Johnson High School who's with me today. And I have been an active PTA member and officer for over 20 years, including serving as PTA president, PTA president-elect, and currently I am the cluster representative for Walter Johnson High School, as well as my role here today in LCA. LCA is established in 1932. It represents the neighborhoods of Lux Manor, Windermere, and the Oaks with over 900 homes. LCA has long advocated to reopen Woodward High School to alleviate the overcrowding at Walter Johnson High School and other areas in the county. I'm here asking you to please keep our community informed of any boundary-related updates and urge you to have regular community consultations. We do not want to react after the fact. We want to work together with you. We want to help demystify the boundary determination process. Too often, community members feel like there's not sufficient transparency. We would like to help with that. We're asking you to support the full funding of Woodward High School. We want the school to be a source of pride for our neighborhoods, for the WJ cluster, for the DCC, with the newest structural and safety advances and a diverse offering of educational programs and a commitment to excellence and serving our children. In addition, we request that you do straight articulation. It is so upsetting when students make friends and then need to change and are torn away from their friends. We have learned during the COVID, it is essential to have a support team and to have people in the community near you, that makes a huge difference. There's been plenty of testimony from students who explain how challenging split articulation is. Please consider having straight articulation. We also need more accurate numbers for school planning. We have found that there is due to generational gaps, there's a turnover as well as all the new housing development in our areas and often the school enrollments are not on target. 
In case you didn't know, Farmland Elementary opened after an expansion and soon afterwards was already overcrowded. We should not open a new high school that will be over capacity due to improper projections. Finally, I wanna verify there will be parity and equity between Woodward High School and Walter Johnson High School during the reopening. We hope MCPS will continue to raise the bar for all the students, including our students and everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding the superintendent's boundary recommendation for the study of the scope of reopening Charles W. Woodward High School. The LCA really hopes to be an active participant and it work in collaboration with you. We thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Up next, we'll hear from Narissa Johnson. Good evening to the board members and also Dr. McKnight. My name is Narissa Johnson and I am president of the PTSA at Wheaton High School and I'm also the Wheaton Cluster Coordinator. This evening, I'd like to offer a brief statement regarding the boundary study scope for the reopening of Woodward High School and also the expansion of Northwood High School. I have some gentle reminders, questions, and suggestions for the board and MCPS. Number one, remember that transparency is key throughout this whole process. Tell us about the selection process for the external consultant you plan to use and ensure that they are aware of all the stakeholders in this boundary study and vice versa. Show us the timeline for this project by publishing a Gantt chart. Do not compress the project timeline and certainly do not make any project changes without informing all the stakeholders. Please also allow sufficient time for all parties to review new and existing information. The board and MCPS are aware of the four criteria that they're obligated to abide by in school boundary adjustments and assignments. It would be helpful to know from the beginning if these four criteria will be weighed equally or if one or two will take precedent over the other. And if the latter, what's the basis for this decision? Point two, communication. Clearly define all the parameters that will be used in the boundary study scope and communicate that to the public from the beginning. Do not ask for feedback from parents and community members that in turn is ignored. Be prepared to truly listen and incorporate what you hear into your plans. As a parent, I know that when MCPS asks for our opinions, it's often so that you can check a box on your to-do list and move on. Please do not do this. Be sincere and thorough in your feedback collection process. And finally, remember that families in general, regardless of whether they live in a single family home or in apartment communities, they all have a vested interest in their local schools. How do you plan to communicate to all these families? Point three, have a clear outreach plan. Please remember to solicit feedback from MCPS staff who work at the schools within this boundary scope. They can provide, provide first-hand accounts of what is working well within an MCPS school and what is not. They too have a vision of what they would like a future school to look like. Consider student input. They also have a vision and they can provide first-hand account of what it's like to attend an overcrowded school. Finally, parents are usually the most vocal group in terms of expressing opinions. How do you plan to conduct outreach to families, especially those that live in apartment communities? And will outreach be conducted in multiple languages? Number four, DCC engagement. The DCC in particular insists that we be considered equal partners for all discussions. Our ideas and opinions must absolutely be given the same weight and consideration as all the other schools and community groups included within the study. Schools with more active and more vocal parents should not get the most attention and resources. In fact, schools and parents should not be fighting each other for resources. We should all be on the same team, which is one that wants the absolute best for every student within MCPS. And do not even consider removing programs that are currently in place within the DCC and move them to Woodward without meaningfully consulting with the respective schools and the community first. Point five. Define the guiding principles for this project. Might I suggest that quality, quality education and facilities, a focus in students and diversity be the three main ones. Quality public education in a high quality facility should be available to all children in Montgomery County regardless of their zip code. Include students in every part of the decision making process. They too have opinions that matter, right? <laughs> 
I am proud to have been part of the DCC community since 2008. In fact, I know Mr. Braden Miller <laughs> because he was part of the same Cub Scout pack as one of my sons. That's how deep our roots are. Its diversity, its deep community roots, and its extensive network are truly, truly its strength. I strongly encourage you to model Woodward and all future projects on building a truly diverse community similar to DCC. In summary, I strongly urge the board to plan for Woodward and all future construction in a mindful manner. Be transparent on everything from the beginning. Communicate clearly throughout the planning process and give equal attention to feedback from all stakeholders. Outreach comes in many forms, so be flexible and open to ideas on how to engage everyone. Use different schools as, of exa as examples of what works well and what doesn't, and certainly do not engage in gerrymandering. And finally, don't forget about the students. They all deserve high quality education in a high quality facility and taught by high quality instructors. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have Brian Hooker. Ryan Hooker, Randolph Civic Association. Good evening. My name is Brian Hooker, and I'm testifying today on behalf of the Randolph Civic Association. The RCA represents around 1,400 homes in the neighborhoods of Montrose Park, Franklin Park, Randolph Farms, including North Quarter, and Randolph Hills. It is less than two and a half miles from our closed neighborhood elementary school, Rocking Course, to Woodward High School. In fact, part of our community is in the Walter Johnson cluster, but the majority of our community is in the Down County Consortium Wheaton cluster. The RCA has been active in conversations regarding Woodward High School since at least 2015. Our residents enjoy the many robust opportunities afforded by the DCC. However, we recognize that overcrowding in some of the DCC high schools and agree with planning documents that have identified the reopening of Woodward High School uh, may be able to relieve overcrowding at Einstein and Wheaton High School. Our testimony today has asked the Board of Education to continue the inclusion of Wheaton High School cluster in the scope of the upcoming boundary study. We look forward to the Board of Education and MCPS engagement with the RCA in the future. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our organizations testifying today. Uh, if board members have any questions or comments, please turn your light on. If not, then we can continue to the cluster testimonies. Any questions or comments? Okay, let's move on to our clusters. Um, the first uh, person speaking is Sheila Brook. Please come forward. Members of the Board of Education, Dr. McKnight, staff, and fellow advocates, good evening. My name is Sheila Brook, and I'm one of Whitman Cluster coordinators. I'm pleased to present comments from the Whitman, Cl Whitman Cluster on the superintendent's recommendation on the boundary study scope for the reopening of Charles W. Woodward High School. Our understanding is that tonight's hearing is on the scope of the proposed boundary study and that the board is interested in hearing from the potentially impacted clusters. We note that we were surprised to be included in this boundary study as neither the July 2022 master plan nor the October 2022 superintendent's recommended capital budget and amendments to the CIP mentioned that our cluster would be prospectively impacted by the reopening of the Woodward High School. Nevertheless, we appreciate being included in the early stages of this conversation. We acknowledge that discussing boundary changes can be a hot button issue in the county and are grateful for the opportunity to participate from the outset. We will be actively engaged throughout the process, encouraging a productive exchange of ideas and possibilities. Along with our colleagues from the other clusters, we advocate for two very important outcomes. One is straight articulation from elementary through high school, and two, the adherence to the proposed timeline. Straight articulation with students following a direct path from their elementary school to the middle school and to the high school in their cluster is paramount. Knowing that they will travel as a cohort through their school career allows students to develop and maintain friendships, which is essential to their mental health and well-being. Most students' peer interactions happen in school, 
As such, building and strengthening friendships in school provides crucial support to students during the significant periods in their lives. The uncertainties associated with movements between schools and clusters will not support students' academic and social emotional growth, nor will it allow the students the stability to strengthen the bonds they have established. Not only are these transitions unsettling and stressful for students, particularly during their formative preteen and teenage years, but also disrupt their educational performance. Preserving a stable, consistent environment that students can rely on helps them gain self-confidence and avoids the pressures of trying to adapt to new environments while also tackling a rigorous curriculum. We urge that MCPS carefully consider the impact on our students' mental health and well-being during the boundary study. In addition, we applaud MCPS's commitment to parent engagement in their students' education. It is well established that engaged parents contribute to the enhanced successes and mental well-being of students. Straight articulation contributes to a stable environment which allows busy parents to continue to actively engage in their students' education from elementary school through high school. We support the proposed timeline for the boundary study with the board making boundary decisions in winter 2025 for Woodward's reopening in fall 2026. Two years will allow for ample time to review the enrollment data and projections, as well as the academic and programmatic needs of the impacted clusters. It is imperative that within that timeline, MCPS continues to engage with stakeholders, including not only the opportunity to provide feedback, but also the active consideration by MCPS of such community feedback in the finalization and implementation of the plans. Obtaining feedback from the community is only one part of the equation. The other part is demonstrating a commitment to transparency, accountability, and communication by truly considering the input and keeping the community apprised of decisions, including justifications for decisions that are inconsistent with community sentiment. By providing the boundary recommendations in winter 2025, the affected students, families, and school staff will have enough time to make the necessary adjustments. The proposed timing alleviates the potential anxiety that the boundary study creates among students and parents alike. We believe that this timeline supports the emotional and academic needs of our students and ask that MCPS keep their interest in the front and center of the discussion. We are aware that MCPS will bring hiring independent consultants for community engagement and technology given the size and the scope of this boundary study, coupled with the forthcoming crown boundary study in the fall and Damascus thereafter shortly thereafter. We request that MCPS be open and transparent with the community throughout the process of the boundary studies, including any intersectionality. This includes, but not limited to, the hiring of the outside consultants. In this regard, we respectfully request that MCPS select consultants with no historical ties with MCPS and the community to ensure there's no risk of bias from the community's or consultant's perspective. MCPS has the opportunity to wipe the clay clean and build the trust that is critical to the success of this boundary studies. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Up next, we have Laura Stewart. Good evening, board members. My name is Laura Stewart, and I am testifying tonight as the Down County Consortium Area Vice President. I'm here to comment on the boundary scope as proposed by the superintendent. We believe that MCPS is correct in assessment that we take a wide view of the county as Northwood, Woodward, and eventually Crown High Schools open. We should not only adjust our boundaries, but we should look at our choice system and programming as we populate our middle and high schools. If we look at this opportunity holistically, we can achieve a more efficient and equitable system that will lead to less uneven overcrowding, programming, and opportunities for our scholars in the future. As we move forward to the boundary study, our number one concern is active engagement in our various communities in a Down County Consortium. We learned in the last boundary assessment that there needs to be multiple strategies in order to achieve engagement from the whole community. There should be smaller focus groups, a traveling engagement effort that includes knocking and visiting various apartment communities. There should be efforts to reach out to multicultural faith-based communities. Communicating in multiple language is key. 
PTAs can and should be a partner, but we are, should not be the only partner. We also expect for engagement to be done as the process unfolds, not after a plan is already fully hatched. Weight should not be given to a community that simply shows up more often because this could simply be reflective of their ability to be online and available. The student voice should be considered at every checkpoint along the way. They often have fresh ideas and perspectives that can inform the planners. The boundary study and MCPS planning should be done in close partnership with other Montgomery County and state agencies, like the Montgomery County Planning Department and the Department of Transportation. This would be a good opportunity to do a transportation study to see the possibilities of later start times for high school students and using our transportation infrastructure more efficiently. Montgomery County planning should be partnering with MCPS more closely so that we are able to plan for growth and communities in a way that schools are integrated into our walkable and bikeable infrastructure. Safe routes should always be a priority. As you look at the DCC boundaries and possible programmatic solutions to populating DCC schools and when programming Woodward, please consider the positive school culture in our DCC schools that have been built around long-standing programs. We expect these programs to stay in the DCC. We also need to improve and expand our programming and we expect parity in programming for both our middle schools and high schools. We have outliers. If you look at the concentration of poverty in our high schools today, exciting, exciting and needed programming opportunities can help even out those disparities through choice as well as adjusting boundaries as we solve our overcrowding in the DCC. More wraparound services and community school models should be implemented as we move forward. The four criteria are important to DCC families. The way they are evaluated should be transparent as the Wheaton representative has laid out this evening. The one fear I hear in the DCC, especially from Einstein High School, is that they will be boundaried into a less diverse school community. We realize that Einstein is overcrowded and there will be some students that will be moved from the school, but the boundaries of the new school or choice system should reflect the diverse communities that populate Einstein today. Many believe that Blair High School is simply too big and their school needs to, to be downsized, but there must be discussions from the beginning that address how this will be achieved, acknowledging the value of the magnet programs to Blair and the DCC as a whole. Kennedy High School and Cluster has expressed their need to, be, to feel more valued in the DCC. When looking at programming and boundaries, please reach out to the community and take their concerns to heart at Kennedy. We are ready to share why we value the consortium when you visit us in May. We embrace the diversity, the varied opportunities that are available through programming, and the inclusive nature of our school communities. We want to build on this solid foundation and expand opportunities to all DCC students and actually all students in Montgomery County. No matter their zip code or their socioeconomic situation, I look forward to the process and seeing you many times for the next two years. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Up next, we have Jen Sawin. President Silvestri, members of the board, Dr. McKnight and staff, good evening. I'm Jen Sowen. I'm a Northwood Cluster Coordinator and parent of a Northwood graduate, and thank you for this opportunity. Thanks also to Seth Adams and his team for bringing you the option of a more comprehensive approach to scoping this upcoming boundary study. Broad scope is broad vision, and we commend it. Reopening Woodward and rebuilding Northwood will certainly be disruptive, but disruptions are opportunities. A broader scope gives you the opportunity to rationalize, Geographically, some of our school service areas look like an old New England farmhouse. You start small and then you add on a room on the side or a room on the back every few years. And it's charming, but it's not exactly efficient. This is also an opportunity to optimize. Our county is growing. We have a housing shortage. We need job creation. But the kids in the new housing, the children of the new workers, need seats in a school that they can get to. They're often not prioritized. 
MCPS inherits the capacity issues as the fallout from other people's projects and vision. This is a chance for MCPS to be heard. But MCPS must also first listen. Meaningful stakeholder engagement is crucial. MCPS has an unfortunate history of talking at the community and calling it engagement. You need to put an end to that. You need to preclude simply checking a box. You need to acknowledge that MCPS doesn't have all the answers. And in fact, they don't have all the questions. The stakeholders, the parents, the guardians, teachers, students, residents who value our schools, we're the experts on what we need. We know what we prioritize and what we want for our future. So let me offer some examples of good and bad. Around 2017 or 18, I asked Andy Zuckerman why people were saying they hadn't heard about meetings on this new Northwood thing. At the time, the information was going through connected to all the Northwood families. But the first graduating class at the new Northwood, they were third graders at the time. They're stakeholders. And Dr. Zuckerman started wider broadcasts. It was great. Second example, not so good. Two years ago, the last week of March, some of us got an unexpected call from county planning asking if we could meet to discuss safe routes and related issues. And that's how we learned that the Northwood mandatory referral was on the planning agenda for Friday, April 8th, the day before spring break. And that's also how we learned that for the past year, planning had been raising concerns to MCPS that the Northwood design fell short for walkers and bikes and transit. Those were the same concerns that Northwood advocates had emphasized a couple years earlier. We had no idea. School staff, no idea. Neighborhood advocates, no idea. So as you plan the scope and engagement, you must not only be transparent and act with integrity, you must be seen to do so. This will help regain trust and respect. So communicate to the public. How will you choose the consultants? How does FAARA translate into metrics? What assumptions are being made about transportation modes, population centers, population shifts? How will Program and magnet choices affect capacity, which, as Mr. Adams pointed out, is driving this. How will feedback be solicited? <clears throat> Whose feedback? Where? When? What language? How will it be collected? How will it be considered? How will it be acknowledged? And most importantly, how will it be incorporated? Be transparent and insist that others are as well. Final example. The timeline that you saw in February calls for community engagement later this year and the study process next year. And then the dam breaks. <laughs> a report is available in early 2025, a recommendation in February, your work sessions, hearings, and then you vote, and that's all in February and March, which in my book is still early 2025, which is not much time for us all outside our day jobs to read the report in English or whatever other languages are offered, check in with our local units that we represent, Spend some critical thinking time on the findings, the alternatives, recommendations, potential unintended consequences, and prepare hearing testimony. And if you won't have time to consider our comments fully and thoughtfully, how will we assume that you've done so? So please be mindful, realistic, and kind. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Up next, we have Catherine Stocker. Do I have it? Oh, yep. I've got it. <laughs> Dear board member Silvestri, Superintendent McKnight, and Board of Education members, thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony regarding the scope of the proposed boundary study in anticipation of the reopening of Woodward High School. My name is Kathy Stocker, and along with my fellow BCC cluster coordinator, Beth Van Gelder, we welcome the opportunity to represent all the families currently enrolled over our 10 schools. The ribbon cutting at Woodward represents the culmination of years of hard work and planning and cooperation between community members, faculty, staff, and elected officials. We applaud the hard work of MCPS facilities and extend our gratitude for persevering through the trials and tribulations of budget cuts and the tragedy of the pandemic. While the BCC cluster was a little surprised at how wide the scope for the proposed boundary study is, we do heartily endorse this more comprehensive and thorough analysis. We have experienced firsthand that boundary studies can be too constrained in scope and that when we overly siloize our clusters during these analyses, we disregard some obvious options. 
We agree with our fellow clusters in prioritizing straight articulation patterns that maintain more cohesive cohorts. This is especially important as our middle and high schools are large and splitting up groups of kids make these larger schools feel that much more impersonal and overwhelming. As a cluster, we may be the only testimony here today that requests that you actually add a few more schools to the scope of this study and not fewer. While we agree that in general this analysis should focus on high schools and middle schools, we encourage you to look at a few of the elementary schools in our own cluster. This is obviously not the first time that I've spoken to you all about the overcrowding at Bethesda Elementary and the now abundant space we have at Westbrook and Somerset. The Bethesda Elementary, Somerset, and Westbrook Elementary school boundary changes recommended by the superintendent and approved by the BOA, BOE over the objections of our three school communities have resulted in an outcome that I think we can all agree was not the outcome for which any of us hoped. I want to share a few of the projections from the boundary study versus where we are today. At Bethesda Elementary, the student body is 622 and growing versus the 545 that were projected. At Somerset, we have 332 and shrinking compared to the 468 that, was, that were projected. And at Westbrook, we today have 525 versus the 558 projected. So not only is BE still overcrowded, but the farms rate is also at almost 20%, and the ESOL or multi-language learner rate is at 21.5%. 78 of those kids are multi of those multi-language learners are English language proficiency levels one and two, so representing the highest need. And BE's special education rate is 10.5% and growing as we catch up on IEPs after the pandemic. This new boundary implementation created more disparity in our cluster, not less, and did not solve our capacity issues. It is self-evident that no one likes the prospect of boundary changes, so you can only imagine how difficult the situation is at BE, that parent leaders who are living amongst even more cranes and more development in downtown Bethesda are considering the possibility that another boundary study is the only way to remediate the inequities generated by the last boundary study. As we are dealing with the aftermath of our most recent boundary study, I would encourage us all to at least salvage some fresh and hard-earned insights from what has been less than a satisfactory outcome. As you all embark on what will be one of the most far-reaching and consequential transformations you lead as an elected official, please listen to your constituents. And more importantly, act on what we were telling you. We do not engage in this work because we are bored and have nothing else going on in our lives. We do this work because we want our students and communities to thrive and we want the system to be successful. PTA and PTSA leadership at our schools work hard to engage their communities and understand at the micro level the factors that impact the growth, the decline, and the population at our schools. We want to help you look good if you will let us. None of us have any interest in being bit players in a Potemkin's village of community meetings and hearings that are just for show. I see this moment as an inflection point, an opportunity for you to demonstrate your relevance as a governing and representative body and to reestablish trust between the Board of Education and the communities you represent. I've been fortunate and around long enough to have been included in early feasibility and design meetings when Woodward was still a twinkle in everyone's eye. I appreciated the sincere partnership and outreach from Seth Adams and the MCPS Department of Facilities Management then and encourage MCPS and the BOE to continue in the spirit of sincere partnership. Transparency, open communication, and active listening will make this difficult task so much easier and has the potential to be a positive, informative moment in the important and necessary relationship between MCPS, the BOE, and all our communities. As always, thank you all for your tireless service and profound dedication to the well-being of our students and families. To you and yours, stay well and all the best. Thank you. Next, we have a video testimony from Emily Beckman. Please play the video. Good evening, President Silvestre, Vice President Evans, and members of the Board of Education. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding the superintendent's recommended scope for the boundary study to reopen Woodward High School. My name is Emily Beckman, and I am honored to testify on behalf of the Walter Johnson Cluster of PTAs and the families of the over 9,000 students in the Walter Johnson Cluster. As you know, we've been advocating for the reopening of Woodward High School to relieve overcapacity at Walter Johnson High School and elsewhere in the region for many years now. We are excited to see the project reach this stage where concrete options for populating Woodward will be discussed and decided. We look forward to participating in the boundary study process 
and enthusiastically support the goal of robust and innovative community involvement in the development of options for populating woodwork. We also strongly support the superintendent's proposed timeline for the boundary study process, which calls for options to be presented to the board and voted on in the winter of 2025. I am the parent of a current fifth grader who will start ninth grade in the fall of 2026, the year Woodward reopens. I've watched this school year as my child has been preparing for the transition from elementary school to middle school. MCPS staff at both her elementary school and her soon to be middle school have been working hard to prepare the fifth graders for this transition to demystify middle school and to give them concrete, useful information about what to expect as they become sixth graders. For nervous students and families with different levels of familiarity with the system, this guided process is incredibly valuable. Having a final decision on the outcome of this Woodward boundary study in the winter of 2025 will give all stakeholders the time they need to prepare children and families for the transitions that may accompany Woodward's reopening. In 2017, representatives from the Walter Johnson cluster of PTAs had the opportunity to participate in then Superintendent Smith's roundtable discussion group to discuss options for reopening Woodward. The roundtable discussion group had as its charge to study the reopening of the former Woodward High School to address the overutilization at the same eight high schools now recommended to be included in the scope of this boundary study. In the wake of the roundtable process, the WJ cluster of PTAs supported the following positions, which now apply to the boundary study process as well. First, we highly value continuous or straight articulation. We understand that split articulation is already a fact of life in some clusters. However, over the years, we have frequently heard testimony from other clusters around the county about the difficulties students face with ping pong or split articulation. For example, a student who attended Cabin John Middle School and now attends Wooten High School recently told us, we had three years to create strong bonds and friendships to then have to leave each other in tears on the last day of eighth grade. Then I go to Wooten where everyone already knew each other and it has been hard for the Cabin John kids to make new friendships. We urge MCPS and the board to be mindful of the challenges for students and families of split articulation and to prioritize continuous articulation in the boundary study process. The WJ community has consistently supported the opening of Woodward as a comprehensive high school with course options, extracurricular activities, and programming equivalent to that currently available at WJ and at all other MCPS high schools. We urge you to ensure equity and parity between Woodward and other area high schools. We support DCC efforts to maintain programmatic offerings at their schools. Woodward should create new and diverse offerings that could benefit students throughout the boundary study area. We were pleased to hear uh, Seth Adams testify regarding the expectation of including many different agencies in this boundary study process. We hope that MCPS will be able to work with the planning department in particular to get the most up-to-date and accurate projections for the many development projects planned for the boundary study area. We should not open a Woodward High School that is over capacity on day one, or even a few years down the road, due to a failure to properly account for future growth. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. The Walter Johnson Cluster of PTAs looks forward to participating in this boundary study process and to collaborating with all stakeholders to create in Woodward a high school that is cutting edge, diverse, and provides the wide range of classes and activities that MCPS high schools are known for. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes a testimony from our clusters. I look around to see if any of my colleagues have any questions or comments. Please turn your light on. Ms. Harris. Yeah, I just, um, you know, hear a lot of themes here. Um, you know, transparency, um, collaboration, working, you know, cohesively and consistently with our other county partners like transportation and planning and um, sort of really making sure that we, everything that we do in this two year long process is, is fully inclusive of all voices and all stakeholder groups. And I, I think that we are, um, you know, I think some of what we're hearing is, is the after effect of 
uh, prior attempts at engagement by communities when the system was making big decisions and sometimes that engagement process did not go well. And so I, I fully appreciate the reason that, that a lot of our uh, cluster folks are really emphasizing um, our new commitment to transparency and collaboration and, and true engagement. And so I don't know if this is a time, but, uh, and I know we were talking to some folks earlier and I, I know I've gotten some emails as well, but um, maybe just a little overview of how we are sharing information um, throughout all of these communities in, in multiple ways, uh, leveraging our, our um, trusted partners in the community, um, and also making sure that we're sort of defining key concepts. Um, you know, again, and ensuring that people know this is a two-year long process. When we say we're, there's a decision coming up at the next board meeting, it's only to approve the scope, which means how big this is, not in, in that, which means, um, just because the school is included in, a, in the scope doesn't necessarily mean, as our Clarksburg number nine boundary study showed, didn't mean necessarily mean that it will see any changes. So maybe just a little overview for um, the vast listening audience. So that, that's certainly a good question. I think that we're hearing those themes loud and clear as well. Um, one thing I would say is that you know this this process is going to be very different than anything that we've conducted before. I mean, just the the scale and magnitude of a process such as this. Um, so when we think about engagement, um, you know, the first part is really understanding and working with our communities and our partners around building out an RFP. Uh, you know, what does it mean to bring in a, an organization to help with with engagement to help. Um, not only reach families, but really reach families in a meaningful way so that they understand what the options are, what, what are the implications, what are the, the benefits, what are the, the challenges. Um, so so I, I would say the first step is really, again, you know, building out that, that first step of an RFP, and then as we get into the process, um, really taking our time to, as, as we heard, you know, reach all aspects of our communities, not just you know, a, a larger PTA, not just a connect ed, but you know, how, how are we able to get into the heart of communities and, and really understand the implications? I would say this is, this is a huge process, not only for the school district, but as the county as a whole. You know, we talk about it from, um, obviously, from first and foremost, the, you know, the, the impacts to students and families, um, but this has a broad range of, of impacts. You, know, you think about it from planning, you think about it from housing, you think about it from economic development. All of that is part of, of a boundary change because the success of a school district is the success of a, of a county. So I, I truly think that it's not just us, it's going to be a lot of different agencies, a lot of different engagement, um, a lot of different feedback, a lot of different stakeholders. So uh, you know, the, it is very powerful to hear our students, to hear our, our stakeholders around what the desires are, and what. What are some of the failures of the past not to repeat? And, and so while I can't map it out completely today, I, I, I can say that it, it, you know, even from the infancy, you know, we will include um, various stakeholders in the process, um, even when just thinking about building out that engagement and that RFP process to bring in partners. So hopefully that helps a little bit. I, I know I can't necessarily answer it all, but uh, it, it is something that we're taking um, very seriously and, and one that we take to heart and one that uh, we, we want to have a very different experience for everyone than what we've had in the past. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any other lights on, so we will continue to the individuals testifying today. The first person on our list is Julie uh, Merberg. Um, thanks for allowing me to testify in the boundary study for the reopening of Woodward High School. My name is Julie Merberg, and I'm a parent of three MCPS students, two four, one former, two current, and I've been a middle school parent since 2015. I'm currently my second year as Tilden Middle School's PTSA president, so I am all middle school all the time. I'm very focused on what's going on in our middle school. So I'm, I'm here to testify to let you know kind of what middle school families are thinking, future middle school families. Um, so I've had countless conversations 
with parents and students about the reopening of Woodward High School and the concern that I hear again and again is that children will be separated from their friends um, that when the school is open and that they'll be moving to different schools. So um, I would just say that continuous or straight articulation is the highest concern and it's our biggest fear. So if you're talking with parents now, future parents, um, taking kids and moving them, splitting them after they leave middle school is very upsetting to them. Um, if you think, if you're not currently a middle school parent, you might be thinking that kids are resilient and keeping peer groups together doesn't really matter and nothing could be further from the truth. Asking students to make middle school transitions without the social bonds and support networks they've been spent years building would be devastating. Creating a strong community in middle school is exceptionally challenging. Students go from a classroom size of less than 30 students to a cohort of almost 400 when they move from elementary to middle school, and just three years later, their grade level cohorts will double as they enter high school. Adolescence is a, different a difficult time period for even the most well-adjusted children, and middle school transitions are very hard on students, particularly those who are already struggling. My first-hand knowledge comes from my children's experiences at Tilden Middle School. It's an exceptionally diverse and vibrant school, and I would tell you that the, the class size at Tilden Middle School is almost 400 students, so there are almost enough students at just Tilden and at also at North Bethesda, which both feed into Walter Johnson now to make almost an entire high school class. They're the same size as some Montgomery County High School if you added four together. Um, we'd just like to stress that um, please consider keeping our school communities together. Don't break us apart as you're, um, as you're making these decisions. And if you could make it clear that early in the process that a goal is to continue, is to allow straight or continuous um, articulation, that would be very helpful. I think it would, it would ensure, it would it'd take a lot, of, a lot of concern about the process away from parents, so thank you. Thank you. Up next we'll hear from uh, Evelyn Rochelle Lewis. The whole government name. All right. <laughs> Hi, my name is Evelyn Lewis, and I'm the mother of a second and a fourth grader at Burtonsville Elementary School. Um, thank you for hearing our concerns for years now, and now the County Council hearing our community concerns too, and recommending funding for a new school. My testimony tonight won't be anything new, but it's a different perspective. It's the mother's perspective. As a former PTA board member, I had the privilege to work with our school's previous boards and administration when they were too advocating for the necessary import improvements to BES. I personally have grave concerns that the Board of Education and County Council might repeat history and pull funding or delay the project again. Given the history, it should be easy to understand the concerns of BES because the teachers and staff have been so close before and had it stripped from them. Delaying a project for Burtonsville Elementary School again or defunding it altogether would be detrimental to the school and the community it serves. You may ask, why do I care? My kids will be in middle school by the time the new building opens. I care because the teachers deserve better. The staff deserve better. Some of these teachers and staff have been there for over 20 years. I care because the students deserve better. These students depend on us as the adults to give them the best start possible. I care because the community deserves better, a community that's been neg neglected for 20 years. In the school's current situation, our littlest ones are disturbed daily from 10 to 2 p.m. with the lunch line extending down the kindergarten hallway. I give the teachers credit because they keep the kids focused, even with the noise outside their classrooms all day long. Imagine daily, okay students, Let's try not to focus on the noise in the hallway. Act like it doesn't exist. You say that five times a day, five days a week, to five and six years old. That's, like, that's not manageable. For those students that are waiting in the hallway for the lunch, sometimes it could take them 10 minutes to get through the lunch, that one lunch line that they have. Students may have 10, maybe 15 minutes to eat their lunch. How many of your students at home can eat a solid meal in 15 minutes? It's almost impossible. I said, so essentially delaying these, delaying funding or stripping the project is just telling our kids, just deal with it. You'll be okay, you'll survive, right? For years, the school has done an amazing job navigating an assembly one in the morning, one in the afternoon, because we don't have the space. Kindergarten and second grade will sit on the floor, the floor that they'll eat lunch on later, 
because there's no space for them to have the assembly. Then after lunch, hurry up and clean up. Third grade and fifth grade will sit on the same floor so that there's enough space to accommodate an assembly. That's doing a disservice to the presenter and to the students because there's no way that a kindergarten kindergartner is gonna receive that same material that a second grader is gonna receive. We're gonna have career day at the end of the month. Kindergarten through third grade are gonna have the same presenters because we don't have the time nor the space because we're navigating lunches and navigating having to fit. Fourth grade is so huge, fourth grade and fifth grade are then combined. That's not fair to the students. So I, you know, I thank the teachers and staff at Burtonsville Elementary for what they do to our kids, for our kids daily. They're uplifting, they're selfless, and thank you guys for listening. Please fund Burtonsville Elementary. Thank you. Up next, we'll hear from Brandon Conway. Good evening, board. Um, my name is, Br I'm sorry. My name is Brandon Conway. I am the PTA president at Burdensville Elementary School. Um, I am also a father of five children. I have a, a nine-year-old who's in fourth grade. I have two eight-year-old daughters who are in second grade. And I have two newborns who are just four months old, all right? <laughs> and so funding Burdensville is actually my future, all right, and their future. We're talking about 2027, having a finishing date in 2027. That's great. My boys will just be entering into Burtonsville Elementary School. Um, I just came here tonight, really, um, to keep the main thing the main thing. And that is, we need your help to fund Burtonsville. All right? You heard from Evelyn, and I know you guys heard from us before. And so we're not here to state a ton of facts um, over why we need this school. We, we need it. And, um, I know um, just revisiting a conversation with Brenda Wolf back in November 8th, of 2021, when I first came here to testify, um, that was actually the beginning of his journey. We didn't know what we needed until around that time. And we said, you know, we need to try to get our voice heard. But Brenda had, uh, had mentioned to me, she said, unfortunately, when it comes to the East County, the constituents will, um, will only show up here at the Board of Education to testify, but they rarely, they're rarely seen testifying in front of the county council. And I think my, my PTA board and families surrounding the PTA board and the members have done a very good job trying to build relationships with the county council and make our presence known there, as well as continue to come back here and just voice our concerns and voice our truth. And so I just want Brenda Wolf to also know that uh, I took her advice and I took it back to my board. I took it back to our, our parents and, 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 and we, we, we heeded to it. And so um, we want to stay committed to this process. Obviously, I told you, I, my, you know, I have newborn, so I'm going to be at Burtonsville for a little while. And uh, so <laughs> I don't want to keep coming here asking for the same thing over and over again. Um, I'm grateful for all the work you've all done. I've heard you speak about Burtonsville um, as of late. And I know that it's a big concern for not just the Board of Education, but the County Council. Just please keep the main thing the main thing. And, um, and one, one more thing, um, funding Burdensville equals community trust. We all know that Burdensville community has had trust issues with being, you know, kicking the can down the road. And so we just ask that you continue to, uh, you know, make this, uh, uh, you know, keep this in the front. And, um, you know, we really appreciate it. I just want to thank you for the time tonight. Thank you, and as I mentioned, Ms. Wolf is watching, so I'm sure she'll, she's glad to hear that. Uh, up next, we have audio testimony. Joanna Thomas, please play the video. School Board President Silvestri and members of the board, I'm here to speak about the proposed replacement school for Burtonsville Elementary. While I appreciate the effort to provide a new and updated facility for our community, I am concerned about the delay in equity in facilities. It is important that the new Burtonsville Elementary School is designated to meet the needs of all students, regardless of their background or socioeconomic status. However, there is a concern that the replacement school will not be completed for several years, which means that the students in the area will continue to attend an outdated and unsafe school zone for extended period. For example, there is currently no school zone sign, as well as a needed stop signs on the campus. This delay in equity in facilities for our community is concerning as it means the students in the area will not have the same high quality facilities and resources as in other schools. This could have a negative impact on their education and future prospects. 
Moreover, the delay in equity and facilities could perpetuate the achievement gap that already ex exists in our education system. Students from disadvantaged backgrounds may not have the same access to resources and opportunities as their peers, which could limit their potential and hinder their success. Therefore, I urge MCPS to prioritize the timely completion of the new Burtonsville Elementary School to ensure that all students have access to high quality facilities and resources. Delaying equity and facilities for our community is unacceptable, and we must work together to ensure that all students have equal opportunities to succeed. The replacement school is what our community needs, and we are so thankful for this. But we must not lose sight of the current conditions that the students and staff endure daily. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Our final uh, testimony is also a video uh, from Jason Maxstein. Please play the video. Hello. My name is Jason Maxstein. I'm a father of three young children, one in MCPS. I was a 13-year MCPS student for my entire K-12. through You may also know me from my blog, Moderately MoCo. I'm testifying about the lack of public notification of recent board meetings, as well as about general boundary change issues. <clears throat> the Maryland Open Meetings Act states that public bodies must give the public adequate notice of those meetings. This has not happened for the meetings dated March 7th and this one, March 9th. Previously, the MoCo BOE Twitter account would publicize public sign-up forms multiple times before meetings. However, as you can see in my written testimony, the Twitter account stopped tweeting these out after February 15th. In fact, the account hasn't tweeted since then. MCPS itself does not provide an advance notice or public sign-up forms. This means the last two meetings had no public, formal public notice at all. If even I can't keep up and no one to submit testimony, how can your average parents that aren't as keyed in as myself? Regarding boundary studies, I would like to remind members of the results from the MCPS district-wide boundary analysis and my personal experiences as an MCPS student. The final results of the boundary study show the priorities ranking from respondents about what is most urgent for MCPS to, to address when considering future boundary changes. The order ranked as follows based on respondents who answered the priority extremely important. Note that these are not my own order of priorities, but the results of this long-term and expensive study. Ensure students, students attend closest school to home, 87%, extremely important. Minimize number of students affected by boundary changes, 82%. Minimize boundary changes, 79%. Cohort stability, 75%. Maximize walkers, 73%. Ensure schools are in the target utilization range, 19%. Balance diversity among schools, 10%. Now, you may be wondering what my interest in boundary study issues are. It's because poor planning on behalf of MCPS in the past regarding these issues greatly impacted my life as a kid, and it's why I got into local advocacy. In the middle of the late 1990s, there was a new development called Kentlands with lots of new homes and students, but they didn't have schools until many years later. My elementary school was zoned for a much further away new middle school instead of the one right down the road. Unlike many of my peers, my parents both worked full time, so my only transportation was the bus. My bus ride was about 30 to 50 minutes each way, and then I would get home and still be alone, where I got into trouble without supervision. I couldn't do extracurricular activities. My parents couldn't participate in the PTA. I was excluded from participating in TV crew along with other sports activities and clubs. But I did okay in middle school. I made a bunch of friends. However, when I got to high school, I essentially started over with no friends, despite going to MCPS for all 13 years and not moving. I had trouble joining clubs without previous experiences in middle school, including student government. This greatly impacted my life and is what made me the advocate I am today to try and make sure future MCPS kids don't have to go through what I did. Thank you. Okay. That concludes our testimonies for tonight. So I will, uh, if you have any comments or questions, board members, please turn on your lights and I will start uh, on my left with Mrs. Evans. Sure, I just wanna once again thank everyone for coming out, particularly our students staying until the very end. Appreciate all the um, testimony that we heard from the Burtonsville community. I wanna say congratulations to Mr. Conway on your recent um, newborn <laughs> twins. My goodness, so I'm glad that we'll have you around for quite some time, and I will say that thank you to um, Ms. Wolf, who, as Ms. Vestry said, is watching, to you um, heeding her advice, because I saw recently where you and the other board 
members on your PTA received a proclamation from the county council. So I would say that you have been heard and um, you all were recognized for all your advocacy in support of the Burtonsville Elementary community. So I just wanted to acknowledge you and say that and that you went to the right place because we will get our funding from the county council. And um, we want to ensure that all of our schools are um, conducive to learning for our students. So just appreciate you, want to acknowledge you. And also, um, um, Evelyn, Evelyn, I won't say your whole government name. I heard you mentioned that earlier. I appreciate you um, coming as well to give testimony. We, we um, love our parents to be engaged and involved. And um, it's Women's History Month, so I, will, I want to acknowledge your wife and the other wives of the men on the PTA board, because you said the county council that you all were doing it because you were told by your wives to do it. So just wanted to um, say thank you and um, celebrate your, your wives. Thank you. Ms. Harris. Yeah, I just wanted to say it's very nice to see you again. Um, you know, Mr. Adams and I uh, were at a, a meeting at, at Burtonsville Elementary a little less than a year ago, and I really appreciated hearing your perspectives at that point. And um, I think we are very, very committed to making sure that you get your new school on time. Okay. I just wanted to um, thank all of you for coming out here tonight, students and parents, uh, for taking the time out of your busy schedule on a Thursday night. Everybody's got to go to work and school tomorrow, so I appreciate you being here. And yes, uh, Ms. Stewart, this does begin a long process of uh, seeing each a lot of each other uh, in this public engagement that is much needed. Mr. Adams, um, if people want to learn more about the process, the plan, is there somewhere on the website that they can go and, and look to see when the timeline for all this will, uh, how, when it will take place? It, currently, we, we have quite a bit of information on our, our long range or our, our capital budget and planning webpage under facilities. Um, but that is also something that we're, we're working. We want to continue to work with our communications office to, to see how to how to improve that. Um, but that is a good starting point. I, I would say also that um, when we think about the the overall studies and boundary process, the policy is important too. I mean, there's a lot of of, of what we do and why we do it because of the policy. Um, so. Uh, we'll, we'll create some links so that folks can see what that is, what the what the language reads around the different factors and those sorts of things. But um, I, I think I think that is important as you as you look into this because everything we do is going to be guided by that policy. Um, but that information will be on our, our website for folks to see. And so if I go on the website tonight, enter search, what keywords should I put on the search? You can just type in facilities, and, and it'll come up on uh, the, the the sidebar that shows. Woodward uh, Woodward facilities or. Just type in facilities. And, okay. Yep, and, and it'll take you to all of our projects. It'll take you to uh, the construction page that shows timelines. It'll take you, that'll show you designs. I mean, there's, there's a wealth of information okay. there. Okay, great. Thank you for that. All right, well, I don't see any more comments, so I want to thank everyone for coming here. Dr. Maynard, did you have any closing comments? Thank you so much. I also wanted to thank everyone for coming. Um, our students, I mean, it, I, this was just amazing to see you coming forward. I know uh, Mr. Kim and I have had many conversations about just over years in history when we think about boundary. It's just an opportunity to strengthen student voice. And so, I mean, it's like this come to reality. So we appreciate the perspectives that you brought. And I look forward for, you know, to us continuing to hear from our students, to our parents. Um, thank you for sharing your narratives. Um, as you talked about thinking about the student experience, we always center that. And I know that there is lots of planning and discussion that go on the households around the experience that students desire. So thank you for sharing all of um, your perspectives. We appreciate it. And we do look forward to con continuing our commitment around projects that we've started. We've talked about the importance of consistency and rebuilding trust with many of our communities um, that we know have been impacted by a lack of trust over the years, so I'm so proud to be a part of working with the Board of Education that continues to commit to rebuilding that trust. Um, I've spoken about that constantly as the superintendent and the staff, um, and so we do look forward to embarking upon a new day, a new journey, in terms of how we work with our community and um, really take into consideration the feedback, the thoughts, 
and keep the lines of communication open throughout their entire time so that everyone can be updated and be a part of the process and most importantly, most importantly, a part of the success when we're able to achieve these things that we all care about for our children. So thank you so much. We appreciate you. All right, and with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.